Hi everyone, welcome. This is our second session in Adams. And today I would like to introduce you to the foundations of artificial neural networks. This mysterious type of a learning algorithm that has won numerous data mining competitions, that is underneath technology we use day to day, our smartphones, for example, and we will look at the building blocks of these neural networks and in the practical we'll learn how to develop these neural networks from scratch using some basic Python libraries. That is pretty much the scope of today, so let's get started. Um, by the way, we haven't seen that in the last session, I think. From now on, every one of my slide decks will include one of the summary slides right in the beginning. I trust you know the acronym uh, TLDR. And if you don't, it would be a good opportunity to run a little Google search here. I uh, won't comment very much on these slides, but uh, pay attention to them. I, I really try to summarize the key points of each chapter on the summary slides. For example, we will talk about the, or we will revisit, because I trust you know that, the foundations of supervised learning in this chapter, and then dive into the building blocks of neural networks, starting with the well-known perceptron model. And afterwards, in the third bit, we prepare for the subsequent chapter where we talk about the training of neural networks. But today our focus will be loss functions. So the functions we can use to capture the agreement between the outputs of our analytical model, our neural network model, and the actual truth which we have observed in our data. So um, you see basically the same outline also on the agenda slides from now on, the agenda slides will be the one we consider and these summary slides I just leave for you to read up in the slide deck. Okay, so I think I already uh, introduced all the topics for today. Let's get started with the introduction. Supervised learning revisited, I call that. I was stressing, I think, in the last week that I expect you to either have completed business analytics and data science or simply know all the concepts we covered in business analytics and data science. Nonetheless, let's have a quick look at some foundational material, right? And first of all, the very core principle of supervised machine learning. You see the simplified learning pipeline here, or the two pipelines, the two key steps in a supervised machine learning framework. We use some learning algorithm, and as I said, from today onwards, this will be predominantly a type of neural network algorithms in the scope of this course. We apply this algorithm to some data that we gather, and remember that in the case of supervised learning, our data will have some labels. More on that in a minute. And then when we apply our algorithm to our data, when we train the algorithm, we obtain a model. An analytical model, a supervised model or a predictive model. And using this module, we can score novel data, or we can apply our model to novel data uh, that is disjoint from our training set. So, for example, in between this data, we could call it um, train data to stress that it is used to build the model. And this guy here, we could call that a test data. You also see on the left-hand side of the slide that this is the testing step. And as you remember, these two sets of data, they look alike on my slide, but as a matter of fact, they are absolutely disjoint from one another. Not a single observation, 
that was part of the training set must appear in the test data and vice versa. Anyways, if we apply our fully trained model to our test data, we'll get some output, we get predictions, this is what supervised techniques provide, or forecasts, and these forecasts can then further inform some decision making or some subsequent system that consumes these forecasts for various purposes. So these are the two stages, the training stage where we build a model, meaning that we determine any free parameter that our model might exhibit, and the testing stage where we take fully fledged models, apply these to novel data, and in doing so, develop some forecasts. That is supervised machine learning at a very, very high level. And let's have a look at one, maybe the most uh, famous and traditional uh, and basic, if you wish, learning algorithms. This is where my friends from econometrics and statistics are always very angry with me when I call regression or linear regression a machine learning algorithm. I know that this has been invented long before machine learning was considered. Nonetheless, um, it is a linear type of method that is also part of any machine learning type of environment. And actually, as we will see in the uh, near future, these uh, linear type of regression models are also a building block of artificial neural networks. But I'm jumping ahead. So what do we have here? First of all, we have a data set, a simple data set, just a data set consisting of two columns, it's tabular data or structured data as we called that last week. It uh, represents some customers with uh, John, Sarah, Mary, Paul, Eve, Mustafa and Casey. And there are two bits we know about our customers. One is their CLV. CLV is uh, abbreviation for customer lifetime value. If you're not familiar with that, it's an important concept in marketing. Customer, God, this is me in multitasking, lifetime, better finish my drawing here, value. Um, essentially, that's net present value. It's all the future revenues from that customer minus costs that we need to invest as a company into the customer relationship and that is counted to the present days. That's the CLV in a nutshell. And uh, in addition, we have uh, the RFM score, probably also needing a little bit of explanation. R in this acronym, RFM, oops, that's a funny R, R stands for recency. F for frequency. And then we have M, ooh, and I have no place, M, uh, which stands for the monetary value. And um, think of these as umbrella concepts that can include a variety of different features to capture the monetary value of a customer. Um, so R, F and M, these can be individual features or it can be families of features that refer to some pattern or some characteristic of a customer. Uh, frequency, how often she buys, recency, when was the last time and that she bought or, or showed up or interacted with the company and M, what is the monetary value? What's, for example, the average spending of the customers? And the RFM score could be all of these type of characteristics together. So higher values could indicate better customers and lower values could indicate, of these scores could indicate less um, attractive customers. Of course, from a revenue perspective, right? I should be careful with attractive. Um, so basically what I'm trying to depict here is a linear regression setting. As a company, we might be interested in estimating the customer lifetime value of some customer 
giving some past purchase behavior as characterized in this RFM score. And on the right hand side, we have some data points. Every customer contributes a data point in our two dimensional space where the CLV would be our dependent variable and the RFM score is our independent variable. It refers to past purchasing behavior. Hence, this behavior was observed and therefore we could use it to predict the CLV, which refers to a future, um, a future thing or piece of information, a future characteristic of the customer. And of course, you know very well what we do with this data and how we can build models from that data. This is what linear regression is, is all about, right? So um, let's briefly revisit the linear model where we make the customer lifetime value, our dependent variable, which I denote by Y, and where the RFM score is essentially our well feature vector, uh, which I normally denote by X. In this simple example, we just have one feature. But um, let's assume we also consider an intercept in our regression model, but we make this intercept part of the feature vector. Then we could simply state the linear regression equation of our linear model as y hat equals to the sum of um, xij times beta, where xij would be the feature, the characteristics of customer i, the, the, the j's feature of that customer. So if we spill that out, I mean, maybe it's a bit clearer to spill it out. So we have our target um, y hat of customer i, and we state, we define that. This is our assumptions, if you wish that we can model this target, this dependent variable, this customer lifetime value by a linear function, a parameterized linear model where we have beta one, beta one would be the intercept plus uh, then we have um, beta two. Oh, well, if I put it like this, I have to state, um, xi1 and then beta2, I have xi2 and if we extend that a little bit, we would have more terms in this regression function, m terms in total. So uh, in the end, we have beta m times, times, apologies, times xi m. And well, it will turn out very convenient if we simplify maybe or simply change our notation a little bit. When we move on to a neural network, it is very common to uh, not use sums, but to, to write equations down in matrix format. And this is what you see um, here as well. The bold y hat is a vector. I'm using small bold, bold letters for vectors. So basically that, that looks a little bit like um, a vector of y hat one, uh, y hat two, y hat three, all the way down to y hat n, where n is the number of customers that we have in our data set training data set. Oops, boom. That's not very nice. Let me try once more. You know, very often I will use the equation editor so that the equations look a little bit nicer, but I think you get the gist of this here. So that is our vector. And uh, ooh, now comes the hard part. We also have our data, which is capital X. So it's, it's a matrix storing all our customer data. Um, starting with x11 all the way up to x1m and all the way down to x 
n1 and on the other hand we would have x oops i'm sorry x n m right so x n m we talk about the nth customer in our data set if we go back so um, oops sorry the nth customer say this is casey okay and then we have the m the last feature that characterizes casey and this is our matrix x And now I have a little problem with my drawing because I lack space to depict the last bit in my equation beta, uh, which is again a vector beta one, beta two, all the way down to beta. And what's the right index? Think about it. it has to be M, right? And that's our feature index. We have one beta for every feature that characterizes our customer. That's our feature vector. Apologies again for the bad layout here, but you got the idea. I hope um, what this, let me use a different color. How we could equally write our linear model in matrix form. And I'm just trying to introduce this form because we will use it a lot in subsequent sessions. And I will also stick to this notation. So from now on, if we talk about independent variables, we use x as a vector. That means the vector of all features of one customers or capital X is a matrix, as you see it here, storing the data of a bunch of customers And in the linear model, the parameters, the free parameters are the beta coefficients. So these equations that you see here, either in the more traditional form, where we really write out the sum, or in matrix form, as you know very well, they correspond if we go back to our data space to just a line that we put here that we fit to our data, you see the dashed line here, that is our regression function. And now in my example, I have only one independent variable. It's denoted by x2. So this here is the RFM score, whereas my target variable or my dependent y corresponds to the customer lifetime value. I hope this helps a little bit to make sense out of these points. And um, we also need our free parameters. So let's make sure we see our parameters. I have changed my data a little bit. I'm sure you already noted that. I have introduced a constant column to my data table. It is the, the, the X1 column. And due to this constant column, if I fit a regression function to that data, I basically have my intercept. So um, if we try to look up x1 in this graph, it's right here, right? The, the intercept sorry, this is beta 1 we look up. This intercept, because x1 is constant, beta 1 gives us the intercept of our regression model, which is the first parameter that we need to determine. It's one of the two parameters in our regression model. And the other one, well, we don't see it as directly here, but you know how to find it. Beta 2, because x2 is the actual independent variable, our R of M score, and we multiply that by beta 2, we find it as the slope of our regression function. So for instance, If we consider that triangle here, just for example, the slope of this line that gives us the value of beta 2, 
or beta 2 defines the slope of that line of our regression function. But um, what's, what's more relevant, let's put beta 2 here. What's more relevant, in our simple linear model, we have two free parameters, beta 1 and beta 2, and these define our regression function, these define our model. Our model is just the line, and the line is defined by its intercept, beta 1, and its slope, beta 2. These two parameters are all we need to know to, well, have, have our model. And you know how to find this model? Let me quickly get rid of the slope parameter. Um, in order to determine what are good values for our model, we consider these distances from a data point, from something we have actually observed, to our regression function, which is a hypothesis, if you wish, how we believe the data to behave, how we believe the true relationship between x and y, the RFM score and the CLE, to be. And in order to determine the two parameters, we just minimize these distances here, or we minimize these, these little springs. And if you wonder why I draw them in this, this funny way, it's meant to really resemble a, a spring, this physical device, because you can think of the regression line as something that lives or is orientated within that data in such a way that the force which these springs exert is basically minimized. So there is a balance here, right? The springs basically put the line in some position such that the overall amount of energy that we need to have it to hold the line is minimized. I, you might not have thought about linear regression from this angle, but um, it does actually make sense if you imagine these, these distances here really to be little strings that exert some force. But uh, what you will typically or be more accustomed to is that we measure this distance, the distance from our data point, the truth, to what our regression model estimates. And we can easily calculate this distance taking y, i, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, let's say this is the sixth data point, so let's call it y6 minus y hat 6. And then typically we square this to get rid of a sign. And we have that for each data point. And then we can basically spill out our, our loss measure, which is j of beta. I'm using j for loss function here and in the following. So that is our loss, okay? Just as the sum over i, i equal to 1, 2, n of y i minus y hat i square. That's our loss. And this is what we try to minimize in order to find our beta. So the optimal vector of beta, the finding the orientation of our line would be, let's denote that by beta star. If the minimum or is the value that minimizes j of beta, okay? 
and for y hat we could easily plug in our regression equation. One last color and then we are done. So here we have, oops, sorry, that is supposed to be m. We could just plug in here, plug our function into here to really have the dependence of j on beta explicit. And this approach is linear regression and you might wonder why I'm stressing it so much. Um, fair question to be really honest. Because I, what I like about linear regression is that it reminds of us of some very fundamental concepts in, in supervised machine learning or in predictive learning. We have our model which is just this, this linear model, this linear functional. And we have parameters that determine how the, the real form of the model look like, what's the, the orientation of our regression line. And we find these by minimization of some loss function or by, by maximizing the agreement between our model and the observed data. And this step, this minimization step, is what machine learners call learning. And in statistics, we would call that estimation. So the terminology is sometimes a little bit confusing because different people use different terms. But um, this idea of, of having a model with some, the shape of which is somewhat flexible because of three parameters and then finding these parameters through minimizing some measure of loss or maximizing the agreement between the model and the data, that is what learning is all about. And uh, we'll need that if we move on to neural networks. It's basically the very same setting. We have a model, just that this model is much more flexible than linear regression and has many more free parameters to be determined during the training step, but it's the same idea. We put some data through our model, we get the output of the model, the result of what the model believes will be the true values, will be the, the output values, will be the forecast or the estimates of our target. Then we measure the loss using the targets that actually have been observed and this is how we determine the parameters. It's, it's super fundamental and we see that approach in any type of machine learning model implemented in one way or the other. There was regression, but um, as you know, we also have classification models, which differ from regression in that our dependent variable, our target, is no longer a real number, but a discrete variable. And you might remember from business analytics, my favorite example, credit risk, credit scoring, where um, this column default is coming from. So let's say this is now a credit scoring example. We have gathered some data about credit applicants, John, Sarah, Hans, Larry, etc. We characterize our applicants by their monthly salary and their bureau score. And we also know because this is past data who of these applicants has defaulted, so was a bad payer eventually, and who has not defaulted and was a good payer, was credit worthy. And we see the picture here again. It's a little different. Now I have both my axes reserved for the independent variables and the dependent variable shows up by color coding or highlighting the data points using colors, which works well because it's Dichotomos. And very much as regression, our task in classification is to somehow find a way to separate the data points of one class, purple data points, from the data points of the other class, the green ones. And so one possible classifier could be a linear one 
which would just cut this shape, this, this space, this attribute space of salary and bureau score, just cut this space in half in such a way that on the one side of our line we have mainly the defaulting credit applicants as far as this is possible. Ideally we would want to have all of the defaulters on that part of the line and on the other part, on the other side, we find all the good payers, the, the green ones and in this way our classifier, our line would help us to identify whether a certain credit applicant with a given salary and a given bureau score is credit worthy. I put some well-known methods here, most prominently logistic regression, which implement this idea and work by very much as linear regression in determining the three parameters of our module by means of minimizing some loss function or maximizing the likelihood. And that concludes our very brief revisiting of some fundamental supervised machine learning concepts. And well, as a little sneak preview, we will now do that once again, but also introducing some new terminology that was used in the scope of the classical perceptron, a very traditional approach, which is nonetheless the building block of modern neural networks. So let's see how that classifier works.